Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I'm giving my first impressions of Tama Chronicles of Ascend from Awakened Realms Light. This is a, well, game that will be over on GameFound, linked down below. Everything you see here is prototype, rules, components, all that stuff subject to change. And it's first impressions because this has a lot of content that will be in the final game. And yet this prototype experience has a very limited subset, enough so that I don't feel confident calling it a review until I have more time to dive into what this game has. That said, you will of course get my thoughts, opinions, where I hope the game will go, the potential concerns and stuff like that I have. And before I dive into any of that, uh, just disclaimer and all that, that I have had a paid relationship with Awakened Realms, with more specifically with GameFound, in the past and may have in the future. This over here, nothing paid on this one, but I have had that relationship taken into account as you will. Now with that, and time stamps down below to all relevant sections, but this is a programming narrative-based game. This is a game It'll have solo, cooperative, it'll have competitive, it'll have a few different modes going on, but the core idea of it is that you are exploring the game, going through a narrative choice, a degree of choose your own adventure as you make different choices along the way as far as how you're going to proceed through your specific goals you're trying to achieve, all while dealing with a bit of a programming game on your little sideboard. You're programming. I mean, thematically what's going on in this game is the AI, the robots, the technology and computers have taken over the world and they're trying to kill us all and we are trying to not die as most people try to do when when they are faced with situations like this. To that end, we're going to be floating in this cyber realm to a degree, taking control of various bodies, taking control of different things in a way that aren't necessarily us ourselves, but rather zoning, I don't know, digitizing into whatever it is, various husks of different bodies. And you will have this degree of bodies as you go through the game, of, of starting with a basic body that you can upgrade as you both find the various bodies themselves, take them to the right shop as you explore this board over here. We start off in the Hidden Tavern, and that might be different to scenario to scenario. But you start off in one location, you can explore outwards, taking actions to go through the very sequence of play, uh, moving around, fighting enemies, exploring, programming, all these different things. And I think the best way to go through this is to cover a basic turn uh, selection over here. So we're going to follow the turn order card, which I'll put over here for a second, and we'll go ahead and go through the quest phase first. Every round you're going to go through this 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 uh, little player aid, which covers the exact sequence of play. To that end, you're going to start reading the actual, well, quest in here. And I have a giant stack of cards. You actually do have a lot of stack of cards uh, in, in any individual mission, but this is just all the cards mixed together. We have Awakening. Being able to see through real physical eyes and hear through feel, real physical ears is a pleasure you did not have access to for a long time. You remind yourself how satisfying it is to process the data through your compiler. After stretching and getting used to moving around on your own two feet, you leave the flat you just woke up in. The city, although brightly lit with countless myriads of neon, seems dead. Eerily quiet and calm, just a few animals scurrying around here and there. No sign of human life, not a single person in sight. This is not the world you heard about in the information net. What happened? How? It's time to find some answers. And from there you have a goal. Once you flip that card, once you read the text, you'll have specific goals you're trying to achieve. And this is a, a section by section thing. This is not a single goal for the whole mission. This is your current goal right now in the moment. You have specific things you're trying to do, depending on the specific mission or scenario or whatever it is you're playing, and that you're going to have to go through that sequence. And then depending on what you do, whether you achieve it or not, you may completely fail the mission. You may go to one card versus another. You may make choices as far as the different interactions you have or what you try to find or what tests you try to pass. All of them designed to carry you through this and mostly trying to avoid the things that have you fail because there will be things along the way that have you fail. So you're going to read the card, you're going to go through the specific phase. This often acts as the timer in the game as you add tokens to the card if you haven't moved on. And very often they'll have things like if you have three tokens in the card, go ahead and proceed to this thing or perhaps just fail entirely. So there is a degree of timer as you go on the quest phase uh, sequence over here. From there we move to the programming phase. In the programming phase, all players will simultaneously go ahead and load up their boards. You're going to grab tokens from your bag, which is going to be a degree of bag building in the experience, as you start with your basic chips over here, and then from there you'll be customizing your bag. And I know this looks like I have a ton of blue chips over there. I, uh, in general, you'd have more of any different chips, and you're building your bag as you go. You're adding different tokens to it, but they're all going onto your board where you're going to start messing around with them. The next step is you can buy and manage augmentations. You start the game with certain augmentations. You'll have the opportunity to buy augmentations from your specific class as well, each of them costing different Amounts, but doing more and cooler things, especially as you get to the big ones over here. But you can also unlock these slots if you pay for them. You also may have other augmentations you will have been able to get from various factions in the game as you acquire favor with those factions. And this is the time where you basically modify your board, meaning you start the game with a certain number of factions, but if you if you have a certain number of augmentations, 
But once you have four or five augmentations, you may find that you pivot and adjust what you slot into your loadouts, because you can only carry three at a time, in order to best work out the situation in front of you. And that means that you do have that option of choosing different ones, of things you've bought, things you've purchased, you can adjust them depending on the situation at hand. From there, you'll start programming the actual tokens around the board to set up specific programs. Now, the programs you have in the game are going to be these basic algorithms over here, ways to gain shield, recharge, virus tokens, which are basically wild tokens, different things you can do as far as basic augmentations, but then there's also basic programs, but then there's also going to be programs and some events on the board, some locations as you wander around, as well as programs on your specific augmentations, and sometimes programs on actions, as well as programs on bodies. There's all these different things you're trying to go through as far as different ways to set up your chips. The most basic for some of these basic over here is trying to structure the different colors together. So for example, I can spend two program over here. I can spend a program to slot that up. I can spend another program to slot that up. And I can slot this down and that down using four program total. Uh, this is not going to help me here, but it will clear up my slots for next time. And then I'll run this program over here, which will give me two of two firewall over here because I have that doubler chip in here. And that will go to my dump and I'll go ahead and gain two firewall. So you're going through a bit of a programming phase. We have a limited number of programming actions. You'll be able to earn more through augmentations, through upgraded bodies, different things will give you more programming. And programming involves either moving a token or swapping a token. Meaning if I have these tokens here, a single programming action can also swap the two as well. So there are different options on the table in order to try to set this up as ideally as possible. From there, when you're done moving everything around, you launch the programs that I, as I just did, and then you move to the action phase where you can take up to three actions, and up to is the key word, which we'll get to in a second. When you take your actions, you can basically do different things. You can take extra programming actions. You can pull things back from your dump onto your board. You can take quest actions if there's any actions on the quest currently available. You can take actions on the specific locations that you're on, and then a very common one, especially early in the game, is you can move around the board. You can take an action to move, revealing that tile, getting there the effect on that token over there. These are going to have a variety of different bonuses that will add two experience to me. So I'll go ahead and take two experience. Experience will help you buy augmentations and remove these chips over here. And then you go ahead and have a location where you now have a new action potentially, but also the quests you're in often have reasons why you want some act, uh, locations revealed versus others. So you're exploring the world both to get the look at locations themselves in order to get the various exploration tokens and in order to deal with whatever quest is on the table, whatever things you're trying to go for in the game. When you're done taking your three actions or up to three actions, you're going to roll dice to establish trace, meaning you have this trace track over here, which is the idea that as you do things in this world, the AI is closing in on you. The more you do, the more they close in on you. And I'll roll these three. And over there, I got two singles and a crit. So I'm going to move up one, two, three, four, and I am up for trace. When you move into those higher slots, you'll have enemies spawn. So the more you do, the faster enemies close in on you. And the higher you move up here before trace resets, the more you can potentially even have a better, more stronger or more enemies engaging with you. When enemies do engage with you, you're going to take them from the specific deck that you're dealing with over there, whatever deck you have set up or prepped for the campaign, uh, for the scenario at play. And you'll often have lighter enemies at first, but they will get more powerful. As you take them out as the game progresses, the enemies are powering up right alongside you. And so you need to be mindful of that as you try to take them out. Once the enemies spawn, they're going to go ahead and attack you. They're going to roll dice to attack you as well, potentially resolving any attacks or criticals on those enemies to basically deal with you. Now, these enemies are not represented by AI, caught by, by, phys by figurines on the board or whatnot. They are literally with you as you go through, meaning they're kind of hounding you. They have these various robots that are dealing with you, and you, as you wander around, as you move, they are following you. It's a little abstracted with the exception of bosses. There are going to be bosses that will be on the board and things like that. But a lot of the basic enemies will just be these cars that are just on your character. You you run, they run with you. You flee, they flee with you. Unless you do things like taking different actions to escape or deal damage to them. There are different options as far as dealing with them, but just know that there's no giant, you know, hordes of miniatures around this map. Once you're done with that, you go ahead and do it with the enemy phase, which we just did, and rinse and repeat until you go through, until you're done playing. Uh, another, another action you can take on your turn is you can attack enemies with you, which we didn't show because we didn't yet have an enemies, but you could go ahead and attack enemies and often dealing with any combat actions you have. Many of your augmentations will be combat base and you can do things like that to deal extra damage to enemies and as you upgrade your bodies you'll have other things as well that will help you as far as different bodies that will give you a different strength attacks or different effects when you roll criticals different stuff like that but that is basically what's going on in Tama you're going through programming phases you're going through quest cards you're going through story you're going through choice you'll eventually deal with different things from you'll have competitive scenarios you'll have cooperative scenarios you'll generate bosses huge bosses that have a huge degree of just the impact that they'll have on the board and the way they'll try to take you down you're upgrading your character you're gathering more augmentations, you're upgrading your 
body, you're going through different scenarios, you're making choices together as far as how you choose to deal with the enemies, as far as how you choose to go through the scenario, as far as whether you blow up the bridge or hack the robot, different things that happen in the experiences, and that is Tama Chronicles of Ascend from Awakened Realms Light. Which brings us to the review of this game, and there's a whole lot of things going on here whole lot of stuff. And this is not going to be as formulaic as my usual stuff. I'm going to just uh, wander around in this first impressions thing. But starting off the bat, uh, my first scenario, my first scenario diving into Tom was playing the prologue. And frankly, I wasn't impressed with the prologue. I dove into the prologue and was, I was like, this is fine. This is a fine experience. But it didn't feel tense or tight. There wasn't enough decision space going on in the prologue, and it's fine. It's uh, meant to guide you through it. This the prologue's not what we have here. This is a fictional map. It's not properly set up. But the prologue basically gave us the, the tools to understand the game. We had some basic robots uh, de launching. We had some basic programs to go through. We didn't have a lot of room to develop and build our characters, and so there was a, not a lot of decision space in the game. We did some fairly procedural things. We just, we just went through the experience and had a decent time, by all means, but it wasn't the game that overly impressed me from the prologue alone. But then as I played the other scenarios, my opinion heavily went up of the experience because of that decision space that unlocked. You see, there's a lot of things going on in Tama that I really enjoy, as well as some critiques and concerns I have as far as where it'll ultimately end up. And to that end, let's dive into some of the things I liked, and then move into some of the critiques and concerns, and then from there into final thoughts. So, as far as what I like, the programming in general is not a ton of decision space going on here in and of itself, but it is a fun little puzzle to a degree, meaning that for the most part the decisions you make are fairly optimal, but I find that more decisions are made around how you augment your character, how you build your bag, as far as how you, what spots you unlock, there's a, what, what bodies you take. There are a lot of decisions to be made in the game, but at least until things really heat up, until you have a lot of options on the table, stuff you do on your board is fairly procedural. It's an enjoyable little puzzle, but not an overly complicated one on its own. You need other things around that for it to become more enjoyable, but once you have those other things, it becomes a lot more intriguing. Once you're dealing with trying to take down a huge boss who's facing you down, and you have a limited number of things that you can do, and so many options of things that you want to do, that's when the decision space really opens up. Early game, early scenarios, early whatever, until you have the, the things you want to do, most of what you do here is fairly procedural. The the puzzle of upgrading your character, it's a lot of fun. Grabbing different augmentations, grabbing different bodies, slotting things up, choosing what you need, choosing how to navigate around this board. There's a lot of choice and decisions as far as what you want to do there as well. Do you want to upgrade that faction body that you unlocked in an early scenario? Do you want to go to that faction, visit them, gain favor with them, and get a new augmentation that will really help you? Or do you perhaps want to try to go to that other the location, go to the data, whatever, to try to reduce your trace, because if you reduce your trace, enemies aren't necessarily fighting you, and that's a big deal, because enemies get in the way. Enemies are obnoxious, not necessarily those first ones, but as you start getting to higher and more powerful enemies, as you start leveling up to some of these really dangerous ones, you have this whirlpool over here, which is going to be dealing cons consistent attack to you, has 10 integrity, which can be really hard to take out. But then at the same time, one of the fun things about the enemies is the fact that as you get enemies, you have the option to engage with them, to try to kill them, or to escape from them. It's Escaping them is often far easier, but they're always going to come back. They're just going to cycle into the pile, they'll come back eventually, and in the meantime, you'll gain a bug, a bug that will clog up your programming engine, and that can be a little fun as well. Part of the fun of your character is the upgrading aspect of choosing how to upgrade your bag, how to focus on, well, I really need red chips, so I'm going to upgrade those as much as possible. I really need wilds, because wilds are just awesome. Those viruses are great, because they can be utilized however and for whatever I need. Grabbing some doubling tokens can be a huge deal as well, because doubling tokens will give you flexibility to just do better, stronger things. Upgrading these tiles up here and taking them off your board will also give you options, generating more tokens, opening up this doubling space. There's a lot of options on the table in front of you as well. And then the story. The story part is, is huge. Not because because I love story. I'm always okay with story, and that's true here as well. I did, I, the few scenarios we've played, they only have three scenarios in this prototype over here. The few scenarios I've played have not been like, oh my gosh, this is a story that really desperately pulls me in, but I like the choices in the story far more. The choices in the story are there. You're, you, you're in this, this world, the this cyberpunk or whatever you want to call it world, that you're trying to deal with and take out enemies and survive in this game. My favorite part, though, is the fact that this is a choose-your-own-adventure. You're going to have a giant stack of cards for the individual scenario you're playing with, and you'll only see a third of those cards. And again, prototypes, so lots of campaigns. I don't know what it will be in any individual thing, but in the ones we've had, you'll see a third of the cards at times, meaning there's a whole bunch of stuff you didn't explore. You chose to do this, and that means that's off the table. You chose to blow up the, the, the energy thing, and so you didn't hack the robot. You chose to uh, sit there and take your time, as opposed to actually finding out more, but the 
robot's weaknesses. You're making choices in this game that will branch off, that will lock down branching story paths that I want to explore. And so I'm optimistic about the degree of replayability this game has. I'm already happy to dive into the scenario I had because I, I haven't only seen a partial stuff in terms of what can actually go on in the game. And the timer in the game keeps you on your toes. There's a frequent timer on those cards that's going to keep this moving forward, keep the pressure on, so you can't, you can't do whatever you want. The, game the, the escalating challenge in the game goes up significantly, even just from the prologue to the first starting scenario, and that goes back to the prototype aspect of, I don't yet have a final opinion of this, because I do want to see how difficult it gets. Because while the prologue was ridiculously easy to the point of being just an okay experience, as the game progressed it got more difficult, but I still want it to get more difficult. I still want more pressure on the game as we try to figure out exactly how to survive, how to min-max our way towards victory, because dealing with these robots is a pain. When you have three robots on you, when you have two robots, whatever it is, in front of you, protecting that little whirlpool, the whirlpool keeps damaging you, and you have to escape from a whole horde of these things, that is a degree of pressure you don't want. Because this it's tough. Sure, you can escape one of them, not a problem. The others are still attacking you, and you don't have a lot of integrity in, on your body before you collapse, and you have to go through a, a resetting cycle of adding bugs, of clogging your machine. There's a lot of stuff in this game that is challenging, while also, like I said already, I want it more challenging at the same time. But dealing with those robots, which is abstracted, definitely one of the things I don't like. I don't like the abstracted sense of a bunch of cards off to the side, but despite being abstracted, it does work fairly decently, providing a degree of threat and a degree of choice as far as escaping them, as far as attacking them, as far as whether you try to de-escalate your trace so you don't get more of them, versus you sit there and take your three actions attacking them, which is great, but that means you took three actions attacking them, which means there's more trace coming your way. So there's a lot of choice as far as how to survive as things pick up the pace and as things get more difficult. I would say that some of the scenarios we played, or one scenario from the ones we played, did fall into the category that I typically like for cooperative experiences, which is when you win, you feel like you could have lost, and when you lose, you feel like you could have won. I've only had that in one of my games of Thomas so far, but again, prototype and prologue was in there and all that stuff, so I need more time with this, hence the whole first impressions, but I do think the difficulty is potentially on the way to where I would want it to be, while being a good introductory guiding experience. Overall, the combination, I would say the highlights for me, is the combination of the story choice as far as how you proceed through the adventure and then the way you customize and build out your character which nicely augments the programming while the programming isn't the main highlight for me. As far as concerns, things I didn't like, stuff like that, I already mentioned that the the enemies being abstracted and on you, I don't love that. It works, it does the job, and I don't expect any major rehauls or changes around that, but I, it does feel a, it does feel like an, an otherwise very thematic game. We have this somewhat abstracted aspect to it, which is these enemies that, they're, they're not represented on the board. If I wander around, I'm not escaping, I have to take a programming action to escape, which again, you could argue the thematic integration, the hacking or whatever, but it does feel a bit uh, less thematic in an otherwise very thematic game. Additionally, the boss. The boss over here is one where, I, and I don't, this is a balancing issue, I don't really know how to best handle this, and this is also assuming we played it correctly, which I, I think we did, but overall, this, this boss over here, when we first encountered this boss, he was threatening, he was intimidating, we were like, we are going to die a horrific death. But then we were able to punch through him fairly quickly. He is threatening, he is damaging, but you could punch through him, and we were able to do so with less threat than we initially had. I want these things to be more threatening. I don't want a pure glass cannon where we can sit there and deal with a, a boss that looks threatening, but ultimately doesn't present the threat that it seems to. Goes back to the whole aspect of what I want out of cooperative experiences. When I say I feel like we could have lost, I don't mean by the boss. I mean multiple times before that, we just made it to the next phase of the quest. And so there definitely were points in the game where we felt like we could have lost, but the boss wasn't one of them. The boss was intimidating, it was scary, it was big, and then we were able to crush through it fairly easily. Maybe that's because of how we built our characters and the upgrades and augmentations and other things we had. There are definite factors at play that enabled us to deal the 30 damage we needed and take him out faster than we perhaps otherwise should have because the boss is threatening. He's dealing tons of damage to you every single round and he was very, very intimidating until we just killed him without ever being in threat of death. Which is another thing as well because this aspect of the way death works in this game is you're dealing with these cybernetic bodies. You can replace your body that's not a problem at all so you could die in the game you could lose all integrity but at the same time there's a cost to it but the cost is not that the game's over the cost is that you have to go ahead you have to reset your body you go ahead and clog up your trace track a bit making it more difficult you add some bugs to your bag there are some things that make the process more annoying but there's not necessarily a limited number of deaths i mean there is but it's like six deaths which means each character can die multiple times which removes some of the threat of what dying actually means meaning again when i say we could have lost in the game 
I mean that we could have lost through the, the going through the quest phase, going through these cards over here, where we did have these things where you either did something or you failed. And that happened more or less, uh, it happened enough times that there definitely was a degree of tension to the experience. But there was never, at least in the prototype, there was never any tension around whether we would actually just die from physical death from enemies. The enemies seem threatening until you realize you can die multiple times in the game without it being punishing enough. And so I feel there needs to be a more punishing escalation of death. Uh, maybe it's just a limited number of deaths. Maybe you only have that you can die twice in the game. There needs to be something that prevents it from being you can die six times. Because while it's true that you will get clogged up and your life will become more difficult, that doesn't make for a better experience. The fact that I could die six times and the game just gets more annoying along the way, doesn't it doesn't result in a clean, fun experience. If you're going to make the game punishing, enough and just frustrating enough that I just have a clogged bag of bugs and it's slowly getting more tedious at that point just say three deaths and you're dead so I hope that's something that they they look at and again maybe my experience or our experience may have been uh, unique and limited because prototype again but overall that's one of the bigger concerns I would say I would say the biggest concern I have is around the fact that I want physical death to actually feel like it could be a threat and to be done in a way that simply kills you as opposed to just making the game more annoying while you move towards that death, if that makes sense at all. Uh, but past that, overall, I would say that my opinion of Tama really is very hopeful and optimistic. And I don't mean that in a way that's not good now. It's been fun now. My prologue experience was not positive. My prologue experience was this is this is just way too simplistic for the experience I want out of it. In a, potentially in a way that might make it a good game for others, but in a way that wasn't a good game for me. But as we played the other scenarios, it definitely escalated enough that I'm very excited to see where it escalates further. I do have my typical concerns around a campaign game. There are things you have to track as you go through. There are different factions, cards you're going to unlock. So there is a kind of, it's not, it, it is campaign adjacent-ish in terms of what you go through, the scenarios you go through, and how the things carry over from one scenario to the next. So that's a degree of maintenance you should be mindful of, and I'm certainly mindful of it in terms of is this a game I'm going to continue to dive into? Is this a game I'm going to continue going through? But the combination of a story that was fun, of programming that was rewarding, of character building that was that was a lot of fun, and building out your upgrades and augmentations, and then going through all that in the world building that they have, uh, there's enough here that I'm very excited to see what the final thing of Tama will be, of how much, what the content's going to be like, what scenarios they're going to have. Replayability, again, I'm fairly, fairly locked in on thinking that replayability is totally solid. That initial scenario, if you give me a slightly more powerful boss, I'm happy to play that initial scenario two, three, four times as I go through all the story pathways that may or may not have huge impact on, on the, huge impacts on the gameplay, but like there's a whole host of cards we didn't get to explore. And that has me intrigued. It has me wanting to dive back in, even if the same game. And even the same game will be different every single time because of the layout of what's hidden as you explore different things, as you find different things. So overall, uh, as far as final thoughts and rating, which I probably mostly just did all the stuff, like I said already, I'm not going to rate this one officially because first impressions and because I, I am curious to see where it goes. But I, I went from being skeptical on Tama to being very excited to see how crazy the final thing gets. What do the powers and abilities look like? How many different bodies are there? How many different locations? What does this world building end up being? And how much content is there, both in terms of the story, as well as just the enemies, the cards, the powers, all the different stuff that give me enough reasons to continue to dive into this one. It had a solid framework around a somewhat simple programming thing that I would love to see a bit more complicated potentially, uh, but I don't necessarily have specific ideas around that. But, but I'm, I'm excited to see what comes next on this one. In any case, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you found this somewhat helpful. This little little rambly, but again, I'm, I'm walking into this one, or walking away from this one, fairly favorable, fairly positive, and excited to see what happens with the game. Have a good one.